want to welcome you very warmly to my talk about how companies are getting compromised. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, Steve, and preparation, also Steve and Paul. Um, yeah, I basically, of course, our companies and our background is not so well known as, for example, Kaspersky, so you just leave a few words where our bank, uh, background comes from and what we have to tell and why we are addressing this problem. Um, so, what we're going to talk about is basically um, what we see attacks that are developing on the market. And what I also want to do is to show you a short demonstration how those things are done, just for you to get a little bit more of a feeling to uh, like how easy it is and, and what attackers do in a network then. Okay, so what we do basically, we're, um, our company is based in Austria. We are doing a lot of IT penetration testing and assessment audits. So that's our main, main topic on the right side. Um, we are also doing trainings and intelligence and all those areas that we're, where we are doing audits in. So we just want to pass on the, the information and the knowledge we have in those areas. We have basically three topics that we cover with assessments. One, and that I will talk about today, is IT penetration testings, which, which means it covers basically hacking of computer systems, computer networks. Um, there's a, quite a wide range in it. So we have uh, on one side uh, web application assessment, which is the big area at the moment where everybody invests in, where we are testing. Uh, the second part would be, for example, um, yeah, normal services, private programs uh, that you program at, at home. Uh, the third part would be, for example, SCADA systems. So it's kind of a wide range uh, that we are testing there. Uh, another part is that in social engineering, which means you're trying to convince someone to, to think that it's the best thing for him to let you in his company or to give you some information, for example. One part would also be just drop some USB sticks that would be the standard uh, and, and hope that somebody clicks in, in it or opens them. Last part of physical security assessment. So it's basically the same what you're doing in an IT environment, IT penetration testing, you're doing in physical sector. So you break into a building, which means either the front door or you go through the roof and drop down from the roof and uh, want to go yeah, to a specific place. When all that comes together, we're at the term tiger team or red team assessment, which means uh, it's basically, I think, a term or um, a type of assessment that is the most realistic one to test your security system. Which means you're just saying, we want to test if somebody can steal the information from our laptop in the CEO's office. And then it doesn't matter how we achieve it. We out outline the, the typical threats that the company would have, what you're afraid of. Then we draw a couple of different attack vectors and those we try in practical. Uh, which means also that we could theoretically, for example, make an appointment, try to social engineer our uh, way to one part of the company, then place an IT device there, which is often not bigger than like that. Then you can hide it somewhere. That has a use uh, UMTS stick or whatever attached to it. So we don't just leave the company and then the next day we just connect from outside or UMTS into the internal network and then start our IT penetration testing part from inside, so we get access to the CEO uh, notebook, for example. So that would be a Tiger team or a team assessment. To, yeah, to basically start now with our development, where we are standing now, I wanted you to just go with me a little bit back into the past, not too much, and we will be quite quick to get to the, back to the present. Those are just a couple of images, a couple of uh, websites I found from 10 years ago, so probably you know the one or the other website and probably know the time from back then. Um, I actually myself, of course, only knew no, uh, Yahoo and AltaVista. AltaVista was back at the time where internet searching was still internet searching and not Googling. Um, you have the yeah, University of Plymouth and the City Council, so a little bit older looking than now, they're all refreshed. I've also put some there, if, if you don't know the other websites, some more well known newspaper websites. I didn't have an affection to one of them, but just put a couple of different ones on there. What was interesting though, what I found is there were more than one newspaper of the year. <laughs> 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 2004. Yeah. So, um, what changed the last 10 years? These are rough numbers, it might be 
correct or not correct, depending on where you get them, you get a little bit different numbers. But basically, world population grew yeah, from 6.4 to 7.2 billion. Uh, you had a number of internet users was drastically increasing from 800,000 to 2.5 billion. And what is also kind of a funny fact probably that we now have more monthly Facebook users than we had number of internet users 10 years ago. So, uh, we don't develop a lot of technology. We do a lot of things in the internet. Um, what, one of the things that changed probably was also, it was always that there was money to be made. It was always serious business in the internet. Also 10 years ago, so it's now. Probably changed a little bit with how or who got the money. 10 years ago, it was serious business, we're managers, we had e-commerce. Today, it doesn't seem that the managers earn the most money, but more the cats. So, Basically, when we look at a threat report from around 10 years ago, um, I just picked out one. You can probably also look at others, they saying similar things. So, a couple of current topics is one of the ones was phishing. Phishing is an emerging threat. Back then, it was one, but we didn't really address it so much, probably. Nowadays, it is a threat that we're facing and that we're dealing with on an everyday basis. Kind of same with the web applications. Those gained popularity back then, but at the moment we have web applications everywhere. So that's also our one number topic when we do IT penetration tests. The last one with the viruses and worms, uh, it's I think, I mean probably have a different perception, but I think it's it's better than, than at uh, those times. It is uh, kind of a thing, we really deploy, deploy our antivirus software and our services all around, so we can we're probably pretty good in handling those. When we look at the top ports, uh, we see, I don't want to go through all those, it's just more that I want to point out, we have top attack ports 445 and uh, 153, 139, so those are more uh, typical networking ports for Windows as well. So for us, there is no reason to put those anymore on the network. Those are in an internal network, but those shouldn't be outside. So what is basically also happened was uh, at one point we had to secure the system, so we just built our defense. We put firewalls up there. That's our securing our parameter outside. What had basically happened is all those attacks that were on those uh, lower levels on those topical network ports, those wouldn't work anymore because we couldn't get through from outside. So what were, that, what were attackers doing? There would be two ways. Either you focus on those that are still open, which gets us a little bit into web application security, or the other thing, you look at a way around those. This was the answer. So of course, if you've got a wall and you can't put, get through it, so you just put something that people like to get uh, in. So they put, started with trojans and phishing emails because those people are still receiving and also probably clicking and reacting on. And basically, to summarize, I said it would be short, now we are almost at the present, basically. So what we're coping with are phishing emails but on a daily basis. When we look at a threat report, uh, current one is like last year, so it's not 2014, but there's no 2014 yet here. Uh, we have a couple of different points. One was that uh, SMBs provide an easy attack path. I believe it was said already in the first, uh, first uh, speech of today already. Um, small and medium companies are also interesting because they provide an easy attack path to get to the bigger ones. If small ones say we are not a real target, that is one of the answers why they are still as well. Target at the tax, we saw, I think it was 10% or so in the morning, um, are an established attack form. So there is a certain percentage that are really targeting specific groups or going for specific targets, which means also um, probably the landscape also probably interesting is we, we are still facing the same things as before as well. So it's, I'm not saying there are less viruses going out or there are less attacks on lower ports. It's just that we don't recognize them anymore because all our filters, our firewalls, or whatever, filter that one out. If you would get rid of those systems, we probably have similar issues again. So uh, this targeted attacks is uh, more or less uh, a next level. So we have like, I'm gonna happen to me as well when I, when I was studying that uh, people would approach over the internet and say like, hey, could you please hack our servers or a server somewhere else? 
which means uh, they would pay for it. It was kind of an underground scene, so it would be recruited. Uh, servers itself, I mean, you would get probably, I don't know, a couple of thousand euros or so if you would crack a specific server. So you have uh, also this economy that, first of all, just goes over every server that is easy target, which is a little bit of money. But on the other hand, if you get a very specialized target with a specific system, you can even gain even more money. That's why we also have to target attacks. Malware is further developed, so it's not only, should be more uh, like, it's not only destroying, but it also is used for espionage, for data information, exfiltration, such topics as well. And we have to do a lot with zero days exploits as well. Attackers are also lazy, like all the others. I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to speak bad about attackers or so, so if there is an attacker in there, so please, sorry. It isn't mean, it's not meant like that. It's just uh, if there is an easy attack path, you would go for that one. You don't choose a more, a more uh, complicated attack path. So, for example, with phishing, we, have send, we can send out a lot of phishing emails uh, and probably some click on it. We have to target them more and more so that they look more and more realistic, which is actually happening. Uh, but of course, we have another approach that we, that we call waterholing, which means instead of sending out an email to everybody, we just get to an interesting place where everybody comes by anyway and wait there for the people to infect them. An example is uh, if you get to a specific website, like a well-known one, doesn't matter now which one, but I think uh, there were a couple of newspaper ones out there, like BBC or whatever CNN, doesn't matter. If there are a certain amount of people going there and you find, for example, cross-site scripting, just a simple cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability, which means you can inject some uh, HTML or whatever into that website, you can implant code from you on that website and every user that is visiting that website within the time frame where your code is online gets infected. So with one hit, I have a lot of different groups as well. Let's get to some practical examples. Um, I've chosen just three. There are more. I just chose three because I thought those more, more well-known ones that just happened recently or not so long ago. One we discussed a little bit in, in uh, this morning already. So there was the RSA in Lockheed Martin hack. Uh, it happened basically in March, April 2011, where RSA hack was at least confirmed, so probably earlier. And May 2011, after RSA said, okay, there was nothing happening, there was nothing stolen, um, Lockheed Martin got compromised and they confirmed that they got compromised. I'm not exactly sure about the time from them and what was the correct answer from RSA then, but in the end, somewhere in June, RSA began to replace 40 million tokens. I don't know, everybody is familiar with uh, the RSA tokens probably. So you've got those tokens, you have the uh, number, and that is just a one-time number you can use for inserting and for your password for your authentication. So once you could crack, or you, once you would know how those numbers, one-time pairs, would be calculated, you could use those to, as, also as a password to log in as different users. What we get from disclosed information is that we have some users, uh, some attackers, and those send a phishing email using an Excel sheet to an employee of RSA. There was an employee opening it from, I don't know how many emails they sent out, and it uh, used a zero day exploit in the flash component on this computer. So what happened then, he got access to one of those computers from one of the employees, so he had inside access into the network. First, what they do is to just exfiltrate the data they have. So they try to get users, try to get passwords off the system, or also internal information that might help you in further attacks. You get copy those all out to kind of drop zone. So you just push this information there. There can be other people coming, having access to the drop zones, and other team that just evaluates information as well. And uh, you have a command and control server. What you basically do in that scenario is to just stay a little bit undercover. You don't want to have any people involved, so you just jump from station to station in the internal network until you hit a point that is really interesting where it can exfiltrate data. This time, for example, the, the code servers where there was the code located for RSA. And what they did is then basically copy those, copy outside, 
and use this uh, to analyze how the algorithm worked. And the next stage, there was an, also a phishing email sent. I think I read that it's supposed to probably be two different groups with two different uh, attacks, but they kind of apparently work together. And sent an email to an employee who opened it. And here comes then the RSA token in, in, in game or into place. So they use that to connect with the RSA token to the internal network. And then basically the same game. So just stay there, hop around the network until you get something interesting and copy the information out again. And that's basically roughly how those attacks work and how this attack worked there. Yeah, and of course, get some profit from it. But that was not in the document. So, so target brands was another thing happening. We'll go faster through with that because it's basically similar. So we have two, in December 2013, the attack on target which was getting public at that point. Again, it happened before. Uh, the analysis took until February 2014, and in the end, something about like 40 million credit cards were stolen, with that resulting in a damage of 420 million for Target and $200 million for the banks afterwards. So there's quite some money involved. What happened was there was a phishing email to a uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning partner from Target. So not directly the company itself, but it's just a small SMB company that worked for them. They had access to those uh, systems in the shops because they just uh, did some normal yeah, maintenance work there. They installed the Trojan, which one is not really confirmed, uh, collected some login details, and with the, those ones you could access to the Target network itself. The Target network was Apparently, so somehow uh, built that you, if you were once in the normal network, you could also get access to the uh, to the point of sale network at the back end. They used that uh, situation to install uh, software on the uh, on the point of sale server and stations there, and most of the attack or most of the profits were gained through the Black Friday, I guess, worth saying. And they stole all the credit card information from there. So kind of similar attack rate. Um, and the same again with eBay. So we have eBay May 2014, so we're getting quite recently now that you know, it's the database breach. It was not so much information to the breach available at the moment when I researched it like last month. It was just said it was a compromised employee account. What it actually means or what it actually happened is not really displayed out in detail. Um, we know 145 million customer records were stolen and the attack occurred quite earlier, so February, March. This is also something we see as well when we sometimes get called if there was something happening so people don't really recognize it so early. It's just a couple of months later that they say, hey, probably there was something, then you need some analysis time and then you go to the public often as well. So, yeah, that's basically my first part. Now we can do the practical demonstration. And let's hope that one works. Yeah, our setup basically involves two stations. But you also know what I'm talking about. I'll have to make this a little bit smaller so you can see it. So we have a normal Windows 7 machine. So normal user working there, and we have a Windows 2008 server installation. Windows 2008 server, has, uh, they all got the IP addresses, such as local network. So we have uh, 172, 1662, 129 is the, is the Windows 2008 server. To move here, because this one will be the more important part. And this is our victim, who has uh, 131 at the end. Um, the victim is a normal user, so uh, he works basically not only on his machine but on a file server. And this was the 129, I guess. Um, I think it was administrator. Yeah. And you have a normal financial balance, whatever you've got on there, some information that might be interesting. Um, this system is quite fairly patched. I set up all the installations at, I think, mid of June. So it's probably two weeks old, two and a half, three weeks old max. Um, since then, I didn't install any updates anymore uh, because I just 
did not want to screw up the, the presentation right before, but uh, back at that time it was all uh, okay. It was all, it's also a virus scan running. So it would be normal as an antivirus, antivirus 21st, and there is another one here from the Microsoft. So that's basically the set that we're running. Um, yeah, so what would happen is, uh, of course, now I have to switch, uh, that we need an attack vector. So we want to play through all the phishing emails. So we send a phishing email, we wait for them to click, um, and then we collect the credentials to move forward within the network until we find some place where there's some interesting information. So let's start here, for example. I have a couple of different methods how I can start an attack on an employee. I'm not familiar how deep technical you are. It's probably very, very different areas. So we'll not go into too much detail probably. Um, you have different possibilities. There is, if you want to have uh, a look into it, a um, set that's called uh, Social Engineering Toolkit. And uh, that you can download for free on the internet. Um, and you have different attack vectors that you can use. So there's, for example, one point that says already social engineering attacks. So if I choose that one, I can choose which one attack work that I want to go for. So I want a spare phishing attack, which means I send an email to someone. Or I want a website attack, so it clones a website that looks almost similar to the other one, but injects some malicious code. Uh, or infectious media generator, which means, okay, I put some malicious code on a USB stick that is then probably deployed somewhere. Uh, we're not going to use those, but I just wanted to show you that's an easy way. In the background, it's using also this. It's using Metasploit. Are you familiar with Metasploit? Metasploit is an uh, exploitation framework, which means um, formally everybody was writing his own exploits, which is kind of a very technical thing to do. Um, Metasploit provided a basic framework, so you just have to write one basic portion of the attack, but all the things around, like connecting to the server and then receiving some information, seeing some information, is all automated within this framework, which makes it easier to write exploits afterwards. It's also a free framework, so you can download it for free and can use it. Um, as you see, there are currently 1,316 exploits into it that are working on different services. If you're looking for a specific service, we just have to use search. In this uh, demonstration, I will use uh, an exploit in the Adobe software, as we had it in the presentation. So we just search for Adobe. And then you have like different ones you can choose from. You can also see the date, how old they are, the state and a little bit of a description. I prepared one, so then, of course, that we don't have to look for one specifically. That's a 2014 one, quite a recent one. Uh, this one. If you want to have information, you just type info and uh, paste it in. And you see come kind of like, um, yeah, yeah, information to that exploit. So the name and where it is coming from. It, it's like attacking Windows, it's Adobe software. Um, we also have a description. Why I want to show you because it's uh, covering Windows XP, SP3, Windows 7 to Windows 8. So all new versions of Windows are also covered if they're installed there. And it's working up to Flash uh, version 13. I think the newest version is 14 at the moment. Uh, it was exploited in the wild in, in April, and it's still probably out there. So it's quite a recent one, that's why it's also working on the newer versions. If we want to use that one, we just have to type use instead of info, then it's selected. Uh, with show options, I can always show what I have to type in. Um, at the moment, for us, the most important one is setting a payload. A payload is just basically when it's getting exploited, I want to execute something. And this is where the framework comes in handy because I can choose after exploitation what, wanna, what do I want to do with it. So basically we said payload, uh, the windows that I don't want, we interpret uh, reverse TCP. What Metaprater does is it's quite a neat 
program basically that injects the, the, the code after execution into the memory of the service. So it doesn't really, for short, for very short, but afterwards it doesn't, uh, doesn't touch the hard disk anymore. Which means also for antivirus software, it's more difficult to detect because there is no file anymore to scan afterwards. And uh, you have quite a lot of possibilities. It's modular, you can load different models afterwards. Um, yeah, so what I have to do is to set, um, basically we say exploit the software, then connect back to us. So we have to say connect back to us, which is setting local host. It's 1662.1, I think point one is mine. Just checking my P address. Yeah, 62.1. So connect back to me and basically that's already it. So we prepared to exploit for this version already. What we see, it says, okay, we run a, a, a web server where there is some malicious script waiting for the customer to come, for the victim to come. So we just have to visit the web page. It's just a question, how do we get them to visit the web page? Um, there's a couple of different methods to do. Um, one would be just to simply write an email. I did prepare an email, of course, um, it would more or less look something like that. So it's, dear customers, we recently have noticed that eBay suffered from attack from hackers. We can assure you that none of our data was breached and data get it takes they secure. So no problem at all. We just have a little bit of information for you. So um, you can check over the following website if there were some recent logins over that website. So please log in and check if your account is compromised or not. Then we can send just an email address and within this section, we would uh, support now our local address where we supply our malicious data, our local web server. So basically, if you send that, let's go to the website. It would look something like, sorry, where's the text? Oh, something like that, right? So just a normal email you've got, spoofing the address is quite easy, so that's not, not that much of a problem. And uh, so you can sign it from any account you want. Right? And when you look at the link, there's of course situations that if somebody would look at it, they would know that it's their IP address. There's sometimes different ways you can cope with that. Either probably they don't care anyway and they just click. Or you provide a more, yeah, some, some email address that looks more familiar, like for example the Google shortener. So if we would take the address from before, hmm, I have to copy it anyway for my attack vector now. So I have to copy that one, copy link address. You could go to any website, to the Google Shorten website, do you see that? No. Google Shortener, we'll put that one in. To do my IP address again, it was 172.60.62.1. Copy, Shorten URL, 2007. So you would, you would get this normal Google IP address. And it's also something that everybody exchanges on Twitter, for example. So people are used also to have to shorten Google addresses or whatever, or linked addresses. So they probably click more on that link. They would follow anyway. Um, what basically happens then that they click the link on the system. And that where is where we are following up now. So let's close that one. Let's say a user gets an email and clicks our, our link. I so said we would follow to this address, right? So everybody's with me right here. So we would go to this address. What happens is basically that it starts loading something. You can also put something here. There is even an action where it says, okay, it's already clean. Sorry, it's trimming. Uh, but it says it's already clean, so that green one is, is quite uh, acceptable. And uh, basically that's done. If you look at the attacker here, 
It says that we did something and it collected some information. It says we opened a meter predator session number one. Meter predator session is now exactly what I meant with uh, the meter predator collecting in the, in the memory. So we have access to the memory at the station. Sessions minus L, sessions minus E. So I want to interact with the session. I'm on there and if I put now system info, we see we're on that Windows 7 machine. So that was basically all it took to compromise the machine. He didn't even have to open an attachment, he just followed a link. That's enough. So now we have access to this Windows system. Now we can do different various things with it. Either we just look around. We can, what basically you would do in an in first instance, look for different processes up there. So that's all the processes we've got and we can uh, migrate into a different process, which means I'll do that for short, otherwise we probably lose the session. Um, we take Windows Explorer or something that's running under my user, or this one, 3452, 3452. Hopefully it works. Yeah. So what basically, what we did is, formally, when the user clicks the link, he's executing it within the Internet Explorer because that's it where he opened. When we do a process listing and say migrate into this process, what happens is we're writing directly into the memory of the different process. For us as an attacker, that means even if the user is suspicious and stops the Internet Explorer, kills it, we are already at a different system, so it wouldn't affect us anymore. We are already there. We can uh, list the different users, whatever we want. I want to demonstrate to you one thing, one very, very neat extension, which is Mimikatz. Mimikatz has one thing, it's reading out of the memory all the temporary passwords that were used. I won't go into too much detail which passwords or where they are, but with this, just loading this extension, we see that this password was used to connect to another computer. So we don't even have to crack anything anymore. We just have the plain text password that was cached on the system. Be aware, we are attacking at the moment also a user that has administrative privileges on his system. If he has not administrative privileges, I wouldn't be able to do that, but then I would have to just execute the different local exploit from an old software to get administrative privileges. So that's kind of the setup. So it would have password, though, of course, not always it's that easy, and we cannot always extract the password uh, right now. What I'm going to do is, uh, we can do a couple of different things, I'm not sure if you really want to go into all, I mean there is some funny things like you can make a screenshot of course. Um, that's JPEG. J. It works, yeah. So somewhere on my desktop, I guess would, for example, be now the screenshot of the user. So if you're somewhere on the other internet, uh, other end of the internet, you could see what he's doing and make screenshots of that. Okay. Though, of course, that's not the most interesting one for an attack. So uh, if we can move a little bit further, um, I've got one situation now that I also want to find out. We attacked one system that is somewhere in the network and we are talking to one system. So what is our goal basically is to move forward until we get something interesting. Um, one of the things uh, we face probably is that we of course cannot directly connect to any system on the internal network because it's closed, so there is still a firewall in between. But we can use that system to jump on that system and then move forward. So that's basically really easy to do. Um, I made the correct thing. It's kind of a script that just means run out to, out to root minus minus s and then we put in the other system we want to look for so basically we're saying everything that we do if we want to connect to this IP address go over our compromised machine and then connect to the other server so I can also do it over my established attack connection and uh, yeah basically that's already it another thing I want to show is uh, get prefs and hash dump I can, when I have administrative privileges, extract always, if I have administrative privileges, um, password hashes. 
So if we have password hashes, also we do not need to crack them. So we take a password hash, for example, from this user, because this one works that I know. I'll just copy. Copy. And what we want to do is we use this password hash to connect to the other system. Which means if you have two administrator accounts on two different systems, you can always extract the hash from one system and use that hash to connect to the other system. There is no need to, con to, to uh, crack the password. That's the reason if you deploy different stations with the same administrator password, it's an easy target for, for inside attackers. Just demonstrated shortly, I want to put that one in the background. I use uh, the, basically the pass through of the hash. This is a different exploit to use. So we say use exploit uh, Windows SMP PS exec. That's the name of it. Um, we have to set the user. So SMP user ad administrator set SMB pass, that is our password we just extracted. Hope we copied it correctly. Uh, we of course need to set the payload again, so what to do after we compromise the next machine. So we'll do that again, so it's like the same as before Windows, meet the operator, uh, reverse. I use TCP, you can also use HTTP saying like outside HTTP port 80 is always accepted, so let's use port 80 to go outside for example. Or do something else. Um, you can also define a different port, it doesn't matter. And basically, yeah, run it. Oh no. We have uh, to provide, of course, the destination, what we want to attack to. So, exploit. No. Set air host, sorry. Shouldn't rush too much. Um, what was it? Four for five? Show options. I'm sorry for that short delay. It's our IP address was 172.16.61.1, right? So let's keep fingers crossed. What it basically does is it connects with the administrator with that hash it got to the normal SMB user share. So every time you have some Windows share open, it will be able to do that as long as you have an administrator account. It creates a service. It deletes everything again, so nothing uh, should be seeable on the system itself. And if everything works, we should get the command again that's saying meet the presses, meet the printer session opens, hopefully. Sometimes it takes some time. And uh, then we would have another session on that Windows 2008 server using the connection over the Windows 7 server. The authentication worked, so it should basically look good, though it didn't say session opened. Sessions on its own. Okay. No, whatever, for whatever reason, it doesn't want to execute now. We can just try a second time, but I won't go to fixing it. I think we're quite pretty much uh, short in time. Uh, if it works, it's fine, and we're on there. If not, then you just have to try a different uh, setting again, usually. It's not always as stable, that's, that's exploits. I mean, it's no, no different program science. So you're using uh, a failure in the programming somewhere, and there is always something that can go wrong. But in the end, eventually, if you've got enough time, you're going to get there. I'm sorry, it doesn't really want to connect at the moment. Yeah, so I hope you agree with me that it probably will work. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
basically what we showed you is to how to just send out an email everybody somebody clicks on it and how you can compromise the machine and with how simple tricks how easy it is to just use those credentials to extract credentials and use it to just go to another station and i think you can imagine if you do that a couple of times even if you won't have administrative privileges on the first one eventually at one point you will get administrative privileges for the server you want to go to so it's just a matter of, of time how many jumps you have to make. Uh, if you put that one, one position further even, you're getting somewhere into that direction. I won't go into this, others also don't know really if it exists in that way or not. It's just all, also normal media coverage. It's said that there is an, an automation of this manual process we did now, which would be a logical next step to do. So if we can just intercept at any location in between, if we have somebody uh, just passing by with packets and we know, okay, this is a vulnerable version, this is an interesting target, all those steps we did now manually could just be made automatically as well. There is no need to do it manually, actually. And if you do that, you have those uh, kind of, yeah, if you want to call it then shots or implants. So shots should, should your uh, malicious code somewhere on the server and deploy your implant or your uh, vulnerable software uh, malicious code on the client system. And with this system, you can kind of very easily compromise a wider range of different servers in, around the world. Um, to have a little bit of protected meshes, this was the last slide then, and the one before the last slide. Uh, what was there as well being said and what I wanted to demonstrate, we had an antivirus software up to date on the system installed and we had most of the update installed, not all of them because otherwise it probably wouldn't have worked uh, with the Adobe. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you see that's kind of pretty much patched system. And what I want to say with this is that at one point I think we have to face that we cannot protect against everything at the moment. We have to do a fair bit and it's very important, I'm not saying that antivirus software is useless. So it's very important to have that as well because it helps us in a lot of circumstances, but not in all. And we have to be prepared that we're getting compromised earlier or later. And for that situation, we have to have an incident plan. We have to know what to do. And uh, yeah, there are a couple of different steps you can do in your company. Basically, it says you should prepare before it happens so you know what to do in that situation. Thank you very much.